Hi, this is Paul, and on Mondays I usually do a little vlog over some of the things that I saw over the weekend that I thought were interesting. Uh, a friend of mine pointed out Stephen McAlpine's piece, Four Things Preachers Can Learn from Jordan Peterson, and One Thing We Can Teach Him. And a friend of mine, those of you who follow me on Twitter know that a friend of mine in a in a daughter-sister church here in Sacramento, after Peterson made a big splash about uh, two months ago in the U.S., said, oh, there'll be a lot of think pieces done by Christians on Jordan Peterson. And and I thought this one was a was a, was a a good one. Um, his, his four points that preachers can learn from Peterson, Peterson takes the text seriously, Peterson takes badness seriously, Peterson takes suffering seriously, and Peterson takes the big picture seriously. And, and I thought those all those four points were, were right in terms of these are probably some of the things that that first drew my attention when I first started listening to Jordan Peterson's biblical series. And I, I don't know that these are things that are new to preachers, at least they weren't new to me, but I think these are these are four things that Peterson gets right. And the last the last point was a I thought a pretty typical evangelical point and and one that I, I've been doing a lot of thinking about in in my own process of working through Peterson stuff. Not that my mind is changing on scriptures being fulfilled in Jesus, but it's kind of an evangelical habit to, to kind of slap that on things. And, um, you know, you have, well, here's these four points and then Jesus. And that's supposed to just kind of make everything go poof and fix it right and everything. And, and obviously as someone who works in ministry, uh, it doesn't usually happen that way. There, there are usually a lot of things that go on. And, you know, for example, I've been paying a lot of attention to C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis with, with Tolkien, um, Tolkien and Hugo Dyson didn't just get C.S. Lewis away on one walk and say, Oh, by the way, Jesus. And then bang. Um, you know, people, the, 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 the reason you shouldn't turn Jesus into an idol is because if you even look at the basic material that if you're a conservative Christian you call canonical, that the Son of God came to earth and uh, spent 30 years in anonymity, but by the time he started talking, very quickly people wanted to kill him. Um, that, that should tell us something about us, and it should tell us something about the common popular conception of Jesus, that Jesus is nice, that Jesus is tolerant. Um, I think C.S. Lewis got it right in terms of Jesus is more like a lion, but he's a, he's a, he's not a safe lion, but he's a good lion. And so th there's, there's nothing particularly inoffensive about Jesus. And to walk around with a Jesus in our brain that makes him inoffensive if you're a conservative Christian, this just simply does violence to the script that you profess to believe. And so, you know, I thought it was a good article. I thought it was worth reading. I, I put it in the I put it in the notes. Second one, uh, this from this from a I think an Australian publication. Should Christians heed Jordan Peterson? Mm, that's an interesting title. And the subtitle is even more interesting. Is is the Canadian psychologist another Billy Graham or a false teacher? Well, um, we're kind of out here. <laughs> is, can he, can, are, are, do we have to put him on a line or can we talk about more things than just in two dimensions? The, the end of the article I thought was, was interesting. Uh, Peterson is an enigma. However, he isn't hedonistic. Um, oh, that's certainly one of the issues that we have. Um, he isn't hedonistic like the prodigal son. He is he has come to his senses and started walking home. Christians should trust that the Holy Spirit will guide him to the Father's forgiving embrace as he continues to study God's word and imitate Jesus. As we long to celebrate our brother's homecoming, let's prayerfully listen and learn from what he offers. Now, this is this is part of the part of something that I've seen in the Jordan community, Jordan Peterson Christian community, where he's either a hidden Christian or he's an on the way Christian. I, I don't think we know that. Um, I've, you know, part of my research into Peterson is I've been listening to things from a little ways back. Um, I've spoken to at least one person who's known him uh, quite a long time, and he's kind of been who he is, and he's been that way a long time. And so this, this, 
I, I think it's a little bit of wishful thinking on the part of Christians to imagine he's a crypto Christian or he's a <laughs> he's a baby Christian, as, uh, as someone very famously said of another very famous person not too long ago. Um, I, I don't think we should do that kind of postulating with Peterson. Peterson is Peterson. And I think it's more fruitful to, if you're going to study him and study him with profit, to look at especially um, his, his Jungian roots. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later in this, in this vlog. So, you know, the, the, these write-ups that, that, that say these kind of things. In a question and answer session after one of his Melbourne talks last week, Peterson gave a mind-blowing answer to the question, do we need a Christian revolution? I think the idea is that the most godly thing you can do is to accept the reality of the crucifixion. Taking up your cross is true. I think that that's true. It's never been presented better than that. I think that Western civilization's emphasis on the sovereignty of the individual in the image of God um, is right. Now, it's important to note the, the, the brackets here because these brackets are doing some Christian translating of Peterson into Christianese. And it's important to note that, you know, there's some intention and motivation that's going on with this. So to the degree that our culture and what is right and useful about it maintains itself and moves forward, it's going to have to reunite itself to its symbolic foundation and its underlying story. I don't see another alternative. I do think that um, I do think that will be a Christian, do I think that will be a Christian revival, so to speak, a renaissance? Yeah, I do. Now, again, um, we're going to have to get into some, we're going to have to get into some Jung and some of the followers of Jung if we want to assess a statement like that. And I think that that last paragraph without the little Christianese brackets, kind of leaning Peterson and turning him into a crypto Christian or a baby Christian or a soon to be Christian, um, I, I think those I think those statements can be actually better understood if you listen to some of uh, some in the Jungian community about their ideas about Christianity and what they see Christianity as being. So, you know, this this gets into a lot of complex things in terms of my take on Peterson. But I, you know, I don't, I don't know that these pieces that are saying he's a crypto Christian or a baby Christian or a soon to be Christian really do justice to Peterson or, or necessarily serve the conversation all that well. And then part of the reason I, I say that is, so there's been a, a, a couple of people, a number of people following me who are you know, members of the, um, you know, disciples of, of Carl Jung and, and one of the one of the links that they sent me this week was to this to this video which I listened to with really with great interest and I'm 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 considering doing kind of a treatment on this video similar to what I do to Peterson's uh, biblical series because if you, if you listen to this guy who is a obviously a prominent Jungian um, and you listen to Peterson you can hear a lot of similar things coming through in other words Peterson's take on Christianity, in many ways, he gets that from Jung. Now, if, now, if, in case you don't know, Jung was the son of a, a Swiss Reformed minister, a uh, very ha unhappy Swiss Reformed minister who, who had a lot of issues. And Jung is a, is a very interesting cat who's, who's gotten a very interesting reputation. And so, you know, maybe if I, if I treat that other video, I'll, I'll talk more about Jung, and I think some some Christians who are listening to Peterson and interpreting his words in Christian ways sh should really pay more attention and look at Jung, because the words can sound very similar, but they can mean some different things. And, and it's important to remember, Gnosticism has come up, and if you look at Bishop Barron's uh, take on Peterson, which I thought was really an, an excellent job, when, when Barron picks up on Gnosticism, now, now again, there's kind of two Gnosticisms. There's there's historical Gnosticism, uh, you know, probably third to sixth century A.D. in the Eastern Roman Empire, and then there's this this adjective that's oh, let's use let's say that's Gnosticism as a noun, and then often how Christians, N.T. Wright, Bishop Barron, in this case, use Gnosticism as an adjective. They they tend to mean a disembodied um, a disembodied gospel. And, and so that's when Barron critiques Peterson. That's, that's essentially what, Bar what Barron is saying that, um, that God is, God is a functioning idea in our system. And, you know, as we get into Jung, I think Jung's got some very interesting ideas. And even though 
uh, what's this guy's name? Um, Edinger or Edinger. Um, he, he says, you know, Jungian, Jungianism isn't a religion. Mm, I've got my doubts based, based on listening to him. So maybe we'll, we'll take a, take a look through that as, as time permits. Uh, this week, I, this Friday, I did a very interesting conversation with my friend Roland. Roland is a philosophy student in the Netherlands and, he sent me an email and, and shared with me some of his ideas and we went back and forth. And so we've, we've talked about Peterson's presence in the Netherlands in terms of the uh, interviews he did. Now, Roland had a lot of ideas about philosophy in terms of, you know, especially metaphysics and epistemology and the rationality rules video and some of the responses I did to that. Uh, a couple of commenters said, well, he's a philosophy student. Why don't you talk to someone, say, who's a, who's got a, who's, who's finished their PhD in philosophy and perhaps is teaching philosophy? And I'd be, I'd be more than happy to do that. Part of the, the difficulty with this though is that with, with many pieces you read about Peterson, what what you do if you have a day job and and you don't really spend a lot of time looking at Peterson is you're going to take a snapshot of him in whatever resolution and then you're going to tend to locate him somewhere in terms of your intellectual intellectual framework and that where that's where he's going to stay now i've i've started reading alan jacobs book how to think and and uh, really enjoying it. I've read the first chapter now, and and thought the first chapter was just stellar. And and one of the things that that Jacobs makes the point he makes in the book is is a mental habit, a really lazy, uh, sloppy mental habit that we have is we hear one thing that lines up with something else, and we go into refutation mode, and we don't hear the rest of it. And I think to a certain degree, with a lot of people's take on Peterson, um, that's that's what they do and maybe it's not refutation mode maybe it's affirmation mode but let's say you're bishop baron or you're david brooks or you're um you know whomever you've you've got a little bit of time to listen to jordan peterson and so you hear it and then you kind of locate him in terms of your ideological framework and say well this is who he is and the resolutions on that vary to one degree or another, but once you put him in his box, there he is in his box, and you go on with your life. And then I'm not saying that's a bad or an evil thing. It's it's a necessary thing for for most of us. And you know, whereas some of us, and I've noticed this in terms of those who are watching hours of Jordan Peterson videos. Well, obviously you have the opportunity to watch hours of Jordan Peterson videos, and that often has a lot to do with what your work situation is. Many of the people at the Sacramento Jordan Peterson meetup come in and, and they simply have a job where they have to sit down and they have to do a lot of coding or something and they can play YouTube in the background. And there's only so much music you want to listen to. You don't necessarily want to watch a movie that way. And so you listen to university lectures and things like that. And that's a wonderful thing. But what that means is that you get to see Jordan Peterson, Peterson in much greater depth. Now, the difficulty with that, too, is that, say, well, someone like me, who's now kind of really been looking pretty hard at Peterson for the last nine months and, and trying to read and and listen to all the new stuff that comes up and, and keep up in the conversation. Well, I don't have as much time to study all kinds of other things. And, and this is where we get into the, you know, human beings limited by time and space. We only have so much capacity, only have so much time to actually learn all this stuff and do all this stuff and produce. So, you know, if you, if you'd like to have a conversation with me about Jordan Peterson, send me an email and, um, you know, let me know what you want to talk about, why you want to talk about it, and maybe we'll swap emails back and forth. And as I've been doing with a number of people, I'll say, well, maybe we can have a conversation and put it online. So I did that with Roland, um, and um, you know, I'm developing a relationship with Roland, and um, and and we hit it off quite well. And so we'll probably do some more videos. And it seems like a number of you also enjoy listening to Roland's ideas. So I'll probably keep talking to Roland. And there there are going to be some other pastors that I'm talking to about Peterson. But but in terms of other conversation partners, if you'd like me to talk to someone, well, both sides are going to have to agree. And, you know, if I've been actually speaking with a number of academics in this process, a number of academics have contacted me. But for, for some academics, especially if they don't have tenure, eh, they've got a little reluctance to go on YouTube. Part of me thinks that YouTube is, in a sense, a place where um, people talk who have little to lose because you get on the air here on the air and you talk and and there's you could potentially lose a lot of things if you say the wrong thing you know you could hurt a career you could hurt a relationship you could hurt a reputation so 
again, if if you're into philosophy and you've got and you've you know really looked at Jordan Peterson to a to a decent degree and you've got some ideas, shoot me an email and we'll probably exchange some emails. And then if you want to, um, you know, we can do similar to what I did with with Roland on the air. Or maybe if you've you know, want to debate some of Roland's ideas, you know, the three of us can get on and we'll have a conversation that way. This is part of the uh, the cool thing about YouTube that, you know, there seems to be near, you know, you can upload all the, all the stuff you want and the, the listeners or the watchers can, you know, click on and click off and do whatever they want. So, and that, that brought me to, um, this guy, Mark Champagne, who, you know, again, one of, one of, one of you out there who are watching sent me a list and he had zero subscribers when I found his um, his YouTube channel here. So I was his first subscriber and his first commenter. And and Mark is someone who says he has two PhDs. I don't know who he is at all, but he is um, a, he has a PhD in philosophy and he's going to uh, write a book, Mapper of Meaning, the Philosophy of Jordan Peterson. And so I thought this was very interesting because he started a Patreon account and will be will be trying to raise money for his book through his Patreon account, and I thought that was a to me that was a very interesting move in terms of all of the different ways that the internet is changing the disciplines. It's changing the university, um, and it, it's in a sense how the marketplace is working. And so he's this guy's going to write a book, and he's looking for Patreon support in order to write his book. And he's got a couple of sample chapters and an outline of the work posted so you can decide if you'd like to support that work. And that's really interesting because traditionally, of course, you'd have a publisher and the publishers are gatekeepers and you have to convince a publisher that's in the economic best interest of the publishing company to publish this book. And then the publishing company will obviously give an advance on the book and then so on and so forth. Well, Amazon has kind of disrupted that. And so you can publish directly through Amazon. And there's, in a sense, already kind of a, a taint that if you self-publish through Amazon, you know, this um, vanity publishing has been around a long time, then people look at it with a little bit more suspicion. And now here we have another mechanism through Patreon. So we'll see what we'll see what Mark Champlain does. Um, like I said, I was his first subscriber and proud of it. And we'll we'll see what else we'll see what else he has to say on his YouTube. And we'll see if he manages to write the book. And he swears he man he'll manage to write the book. And I'm sure, um, you know, kind of like some of these other some of these other internet funding mechanisms will will see what happens because you know who who are we to know Mark Champlain but who are we to know who who Paul Vanderclay is and what he is and and what he does. Another interesting piece was in the Toronto Star and um, I don't live in Toronto so I don't kind of know the reputation of the Toronto Star but the title of the piece was interesting enough with the Jordan Peterson hysteria which was which I thought really thought was a great title so probably some some editor deserves some credit and this is this is how he concludes it Peterson supporters are contemptuous of his opponents highlighting the lunatics rather than listening to those from the marginalized communities who have valid fears about what is being argued his opponents um, his opponents refuse to give Peterson credit for anything he says when in fact um, if we unwrap the showmanship and the ludicrous zeal, the man sometimes asks essential questions. Frankly, I'm sick and tired of older privileged journalists dismissing and sometimes mocking minority sensitivities. They're generally white men and have been unchallenged in their careers. Sorry, guys, times are changing and about time too. Equally, I've had enough hysteria. Um, I've had enough of the hysteria brigade screaming at every offensible, ostensible offense urging censorship as a political weapon and making no distinction between what is generally genuinely dangerous and what is merely challenging a plague on both your bloody houses. Um, Jordan Peterson is not in some infallible figures. Some of what he says is absurd and wrong. His followers are far often too motivated by misplaced fear and nostalgia. A lot of his most vociferous critics don't even know what he is saying and need to learn that violence is entirely unacceptable and that they usually play and that they usually play into Peterson's hands. So there you have it. Um, he likes the middle of the road. Um, yeah, that's going to get some interesting responses from both sides. Uh, I, I personally, the, um, the line, um, I'm sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of the line. I'm sick and tired because what that line essentially does is, is, is 
invites us all to participate in your immediate emotional situation. And well, I'm, I'm sick and tired of going bald. I'm sick and tired of all kinds of things in the world. I was just in Massachusetts where everyone's sick and tired of the weather. You can be sick and tired of being sick and tired. It's, uh, it's not really an argument. And, um, so this guy's expressing his opinion. It's an opinion piece. Um, but I thought it was, I thought it had a great title and some of you might enjoy it. A non-Jordan Peterson piece that I read, uh, this weekend, which I thought was, was really quite amazing, was in the Atlantic. Why the Earth's history appears so miraculous. And, and it's a long piece, but, but something really quite worth reading in terms of, um, in, in some ways the fine tuning theory about the universe. Um, a, a number of years ago, I found a very interesting YouTube, um, conversation. I think it might have been on Veritas Forum where, where someone was making the point. He was the atheist in that conversation. He was making the point where, you know, it's, it's, it's really amazing that we've lasted this long. And, and it is. Um, I mean, asteroids could wipe us out and nuclear weapons could wipe us out and all kinds of things could wipe us out. But yet here we are. And, and so what are we to think about that? What are we to think about those odds? How are we to regard it? The, um, I think a number of you will, will probably enjoy this piece. Um, those of you who like reading articles, and I know that's, that's not all of you. And I want to give a special thanks to Josh, who Josh is a longtime Patreon supporter of Jordan Peterson, and he had a half-hour conversation um, uh, scheduled with Peterson, and he gave it to me. And I thought that was just a really generous thing that Josh did. And I know a number of you have been, you know, clamoring for me to talk to Peterson. Well, I'll, I'll record it if that is permissible, and, and we'll see. And when I look back at some of the other conversations like this that people have done with Peterson, you know, the first 10 minutes are kind of Peterson getting to know who he's talking to. And that's, that's pretty much necessary if you're him, because all of us are, are watching his videos. And in a sense, we have a leg up on him because we have a, at least some idea who he is and he has zero idea who we are. And so if you actually want to have a productive conversation, it's good to know the other party. I, I think a lot of people uh, fail to underestimate just how difficult it is to have a productive conversation between two people who don't know each other. Um, just, just in terms of kind of finding each other and making sure they're not talking past each other or, or just, um, initiating random ideas in the other person. If you actually want to have a good conversation, it's, it's not a simple thing. And given the, given the fact that I think with these Patreon conversations, you're basically on the clock. You get a half hour with a good doctor and, you know, boom, you jump in the room. And so we'll see how it goes. Um, I've been thinking about, I've actually been spending quite a bit of time thinking about what I want to ask and how I want to frame it because I've got a half hour and, and I want to use that, I want to use that time well. Um, uh, tiger burning is a, is a, is a very, um, active commenter on my channel. And, uh, Tiger had a, had a very interesting, um, had a very interesting take on some of what's going on. Sorry to keep making comments. I don't think he can stop. Um, and this should be considered somewhat ironic comment by anyone who is at all familiar with Jordan Peterson, but we are perhaps making the focus and scope of Peterson's insight and impact a bit too narrow. I don't mean in the sense of how does this affect Christians, or I don't mean, or I don't mean that primarily, I think, now, now Tiger tends to have some run on sentences here. So he's got to run on through there. I'm leaving it on the screen. You can read it. You can find it in the comments section. You can respond to it in the comments section. But, but I think the point he made here is, is essentially correct. I assume and believe this is, uh, I guess got to read some of the sentences. The primary impact of Jordan Peterson should probably be first and foremost personal, I think. But when, I, when one is talking to a Christian pastor with a career, an established church, a family, a history, a trajectory of accomplishments, one would and should assume, I think, that such a person sort of already has sorted himself out. And, well, thanks for the, um, thanks for the compliment. I think you're talking about me and I, um, you know, I've certainly got myself sorted out to a degree, at least sufficient that I can have a YouTube channel and maintain a job. But none of us have ourselves sorted out perfectly. I assume and believe that this is the case um, with you, at least to a reasonable extent. You're obviously quite intelligent, engaged with this topic already, vis-a-vis -vis Peterson and Christianity and Christian apologetics. I would love to hear you address Peterson and his platform as a catalyst for building some sort of transformative online community where perhaps atheist agnostic seekers and Christians engaged in Christianity as more of a process than an end could meet and attempt some sort of online accountability or perhaps even see 
what we could do to expand this little community to our own communities or am I just being way too grandiose? Well, I think Tiger is, um, Tiger Burning is reading me absolutely correctly because this is exactly what I'm trying to do with my channel. This is exactly what I'm trying to do with all of my engagement. Now, as a Christian minister, obviously, it would be my great joy and delight if everyone watching this became a, an active and professing Christian. Um, that's, that's, this is who I am. This is my belief. This is my religious system. This is my calling. All of that is true. But I also know that that likely will not happen. And so what do I want from this enterprise? Uh, I do want people to sort themselves out. I do want people to have happy and fruitful and productive lives. I do want people to um, work uh, joyfully and um, profitably in this world. And and if you don't become a Christian, I will still call you my friend and I will still I will still bless you and I will still pray for you. And so if you're an atheist or an agnostic or a Nazi or a or a or a Jew or a you know whatever category you want to put yourself in when when Jesus commands us to love your enemies, well, that means um, love your neighbors and love your enemies. Well, that pretty much gets everyone in the group. Now, being able to pull that off and being able to actually live that out, that's that's no small thing. And none of us are sufficiently sorted on that regard. So, but this is exactly what I'd love to do. And, and this is, in fact, I think, at least today, um, about a week and a half before I talk to Peterson, if in fact happens. I mean, these things sometimes fall through. But, I mean, this is probably the, the way I'm going to take this conversation in terms of, you know, one of the things that he's been doing, he's been talked about a gateway in terms of Christianity. Jonathan Peugeot talks about him in terms of Cyrus, the um, the Persian emperor who, who sends the Jews back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Uh, another friend of mine, um, uh, John Van Donk in Southern California, he said, you know, I don't know if it's original to him or not. He said, Jordan Peterson is a magi. You know, he, in a sense, comes to the, um, comes to the house where, where baby Jesus um, and his and Mary and Joseph are living and brings gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So, you know, who is Jordan Peterson? Where did he, what is he, where does he stand with respect to Christianity? I mean, all of those are, are fun things to talk about, and I think profitable things to talk about. But, you know, whether Jordan Peterson is a Christian or isn't a Christian, I mean, God finally is God, and God is the judge, and, and God sorts these things out, and he says, you know, basically, I'm the judge you know, be careful about how you judge. So it's not, it's not my place to convert Jordan Peterson. It's not my place to try and uh, coerce people into some of these things. Um, but, you know, I do want to have a conversation about, okay, so Peterson has written a book and he's got a YouTube channel and he's obviously launched a number of especially young men on the journey to sort themselves out, to become heroes. I thought, I thought Bishop Barron nailed that pretty well, to you know, to, 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 to live out their potential. And I think you got Peterson making the case over here. And in that sense, you know, looking at the Australian piece, is he kind of a Billy Graham? Well, in the sense that he's, you know, filling auditoriums and people are getting inspired by his message and it's changing their lives. But unlike Billy Graham and the Billy Graham evangelistic crusade, there's no church behind it. And, and so a lot of my attention has been to the church and to pastors and, and even in my own ministry, I'm, I'm struggling to figure out, you know, okay, how does this fit into my ministry? You know, part of this has, has taken the, again, this was John Van Donk's idea, my friend in Southern California. And if you write me and you ask me for, you know, a reference in Southern California, I might just send you John's way. Um, John is a, I'm planning on doing a conversation with John online, but he's a little, he's a little hesitant. And like I said, YouTube is a place for either people have nothing left to lose or, or, or are not afraid of losing or maybe too foolish to be afraid of losing what they have. But this is why I started the, the Jordan Peterson meetup group in Sacramento because, um, you know, meet together and some in this group are already Christian. Some of these are, some of these individuals are atheists, some are agnostic, some, are you know practitioners and believers of other religions 
but we do in fact get together. And one of the hard things for me is I don't pray before the meeting because as a Christian reformed minister, we always pray before meetings and we usually pray at the end of meetings. And so, you know, we don't pray before the meeting. We don't open a Bible. In fact, I'm not going to talk about Christianity probably at all in the core, in the course of a meeting, but we talk about Jordan Peterson. And so Tiger Burning's question for me is a very real one because what I'm wanting to be able, what I want to see is a way for people to be able to sort themselves out and, and figure out their lives and, and do what they need to do to begin to realize their potential to get out of their mother's basement and to, you know, get into a, an, a long-term relationship and to get married and to have children and to hold down a job and to, you know, and in terms of Christianity, to be able to go to church every week, to, um, to, to meditate on the scriptures, to pray with regularity, to, um, to, to give of your money and give of your talents. I mean, that's being a Christian not only involves belief, it be law, it, it involves behavior. And, and this is probably the other area I'll, I'll want to talk to Peterson about will be, you know, okay, so you're a pragmatist. Well, if you, if you live as if the resurrection is real, well, how does that change your life? And, and at some point you're going to have to deal with the church. You know, it's interesting as I was thinking about this question, you know, would Jesus be Jesus if it weren't for the church? Um, uh, that's a, that's a really serious question to ponder and, and to ask yourself. So that's, this is what's rummaging around in my head here on, on March 19. Um, as always, um, and I know you will leave comments in the comment section. I've tried to get back into it again. I didn't try to go back and go through all the comments I missed last week, which is kind of too bad because those were after those, some of those more philo philosophical videos and, um, but, you know, I enjoy the engagement and, and Tiger Burning's question is, is really my question. Um, just like Jordan Peterson is asking the question, well, can you have an online university? I'm not really trying to start an online church. Um, I, I have issues with that because I think we are made to, to, to relate in, in real time and space and meet space. And I think there's an element to that that gets distorted when we talk through this medium. So, but, but these are the kinds of questions that I have. And so I think Tiger Burning is dead on right. So yeah, let me know what you think.